hear me ah you can hey there hey you oh, new guitar day uh happy happy ngd i think it's mark wine they always do that happy uh new guitar day uh let's see okay david i'll check it out on facebook uh i think i've got two so far i got pepper and uh chris maybe i'm not sure Quarantiners, that's right. We're all stuck. We're all in this together. Nothing could take us apart and bring us together so much than the than this whole thing. So, hey, Walter, good to see you. Uh, I'll give a few minutes for people to start showing up. We're going to talk about. We're going to. We're going to. I'm going to push that uh, the ninth. Um, chords another day we're going to do those tomorrow probably but i want to kind of kind of knock out a bunch of chords that um i've been asked about suspended chords um and uh we're going to talk about basically two chords four chords and six chords and um we're going to basically start with triads and kind of add things to them and, and see what happens so um <laughs> yeah we're committed we all are committed <laughs> Chad, I would, but I don't want to get a copyright infringement. <laughs> but I will tell you this. Everybody plays uh, uh, Smoke on the Water. When I learned it, I learned it with fists and so on and so forth. Uh, but actually, he uses open G and D, so he actually puts the fifth on the bottom. He plays it like that. So uh, not I, I probably learned it. I mean, played it wrong for many years, and I taught it wrong for many years. But it was always a good early guitar lesson. I mean, that was one of the... One of the first lessons I would teach when I was teaching guitar, I would teach, um, there were certain songs I would teach. First songs would be on the bottom string, uh, like, um, oh, what's the, the um, Peter Gunn. Um, and then I might do uh, 25 or six to four, just to kind of get some dexterity on the strings. Speaking of dexterity on the strings, get your guitar out. We're gonna do our warm up, okay? Uh, we're going to do our pinky warm up, which is, uh, I think I have the link right here. The two, copy this. Um, there's two left handed exercises one easy, one, one just the one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one. Um, two, three, four, four, three, two, one. But we're actually going to jump right to the one, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. And again, this, this, um, hey, Kathy. My admin. But you can see every other note is the pinky. Um, so the idea is to get your pinky involved. It's also the idea is to keep your pinky available. What When you play this exercise enough, it'll force you to kind of keep your pinky out. So let's go ahead and start. First finger on the first fret of the first string. Pinky on the fourth fret of the first string. Third finger on the third fret of the first string then pinky again, and then second finger on the second fret, and then pinky again on the fourth fret, and then third finger again on the third fret, and pinky on the fourth fret. So right now, um, in fact, let's just do this all the way down the strings. Right now, the, the fingers um, are the same as the frets. Okay, let's go to the second string. Go one, four, two, I'm sorry, three, four, two, four, three, four. Yeah, Walter, you can play air guitar. It's totally fine. You can still do this. In fact, you could do it this way. One, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. Sometimes when I've showed chords and I didn't have a guitar, I would, I would go, oh, play it like this, you know. Um, so we have uh, the next string, third string. One, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. Fourth string. One, four, three, four. Uh, 
two, four, three, four. Okay, then bottom uh, fifth string. One, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. And try to keep your thumb behind the net. Okay, now the bottom string, the sixth string. One, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. So this is a good warm up. Um, and then you could we could go up to second fret on the first string. One, four. I'm talking about fingers here, not frets. One, four, three, four, two, four, three, four. And you can practice your alter alternating picking too if you can. You kill two birds with one stone. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. And then go up another fret. One more, we'll do one more after this. And then what? Here. Okay, so just kind of get the blood flow into the hands here. My hands are cold right now, so I remember to turn my light on though. <laughs> so you can't take a sip. Everybody can take a free sip. It's like the middle space on a bingo card. Everybody's allowed one free sip. So go for it right now. Okay, so, oh, we've got 39 people, so that's pretty good. So what I want to talk about, I think what I want to do is I want to take the caged chords, the the, the um, C, A, G, E, and D, and I just want, I want to talk about those shapes, and uh, let's determine what notes we have. Every one of those is a major triad, so there's only three notes in them, but sometimes, like we have a D chord here, we have six, we have six notes. So there's a lot of duplication, okay? Um, so we have, in that in this G, we have three Gs, we have two Bs and a D. So the, the triad is GBD, um, but, but what we have are multiple notes of that. So, so when it comes to doing uh, fourths and sixths and seconds, you've got some options as far as where are you going to make the movement, okay? So um, I'm going to start by... Uh, let's see. The thing is, when we do different chords, we're going to have different sharps. Uh, in particularly in these, we're only going to have sharps. We're not going to have flats. Uh, but we're going to have uh, some some different keys represented. So it might be difficult. We could do, do everything in C. Uh, but I kind of just want to go through the main, um, uh, the, like I said, the, the caged chords to start with. So let's start with the C because that's what caged starts with. Okay, and so C is standard basic C is that. Okay, you know that. Oh, it's, uh, yeah, it's probably around 62, 63 here, something like that. Wow, it's really cold in Holland, Dennis. I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I'm waiting for the warm weather. So, um, so we know how to play a C chord. C, you know, and we know, but what are these notes? So let's, of course, we're going to skip the bottom string for now. But what's this note? Can somebody tell me, just write out those five notes for me in order? Yeah, yeah, that's right. The bottom note's C. Very good, Chris. And that would make sense because we're playing a C chord. The root would be C. The bass note, if we were going to have a different bass note, we'd have to do a slash. C, E, G, C, E. Very good, Ab. That's exactly right. Okay? C, E, G, C, E. Now, if we were to um, write out, and that and Jim, that's the triad. That's the triad we're playing, but we have multiple, we have more than three notes in this chord. We have five. So we, we have definitely have some doubles here. Um, AJ, perfect. Exactly right. And AJ, sorry, I, I keep meaning to, to give you a ring and, and go through your papers. I keep... My days just get filled up <laughs> and I went really long yesterday and I didn't want to call it yesterday anyway. Um, okay. So now, now, okay. So we, we know the, we know the fret numbers three, two, zero, one, zero, which also corresponds with the fingerings in this case, that's rare, but three, third finger, second finger open, first finger and open. And now we know the notes. Okay. Uh, C, E, G, C, E. So we have two C's, two E's and a G in the middle. OK, 
Okay. Now, what is the what are the values of these notes? Are they roots? Which ones are roots of third or fifth? So, so if we were to do that, C is the root. So we could say from the bottom to the top, it'd be root third, fifth, root third is the makeup. Okay. You see that? Root third, fifth, root third. Okay. So when we talk about, you've heard about suspended chords. I really generally think, I only think of one chord as being suspended chord. In fact, that thought is so common that the term, if I were to say C sus, everyone would naturally suspend the fourth. That didn't always used to be the case. And if any of you have been playing a long time like I have, you can probably remember when people would write out, you know, sus four, like they would write out C sus four because they wanted you to suspend the fourth. Um, and we're going to talk about what that means. Um, so if we look at uh, the C scale, and this time I don't need to write out two octaves, but if I write out a C scale, just one octave, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, like that, and then number it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one, like that, okay? We can uh, we can see what might be considered the four. It would be the F note in the in a C chord. It's the it's the fourth degree of the C major scale, um, and so the four chord, the four note, the F note is the note we want to add to the C triad um, to make it a sus chord. Okay, sus four, like I said, is the most common. So. C, D, G would be a two chord, no third. So we're going to talk about that one, David, too. But right now, we'll talk about the first one, the most common one, the C, the, uh, the C sus chord, or a sus chord. Um, and the problem with this, this voicing, is we have two E's. So when you do C sus or C sus four, what you're doing is you're moving the third up to the fourth. You're getting rid of the third, and you're going up to the fourth. And you're keeping the G. So you have C, F, G would be a C, sus, four. But like I said, C, sus, four, you can shorthand that. But it would be C, F, G would equal C, sus, four. But because we really don't talk about, there's a reason why we don't really talk about sus, two chords and sus, six chords. We used to. We used to say C, sus, two would be a, what I would call a C, two chord. And C sus, sus six would be a what I would just call a six chord. Um, or if you were to sus, well, let me let me actually what I would do if I would do the C sus two chord, you would take the root up to two. And if you didn't have a root, then you would have D E and G, and you might end up calling uh, sorry yeah D E and G. You might end up calling that something else. Uh, that might be an, it, it sound more like an E minor seven chord than it would a C chord. Um, same thing if you sus the six, which means take the five, which is G, up to the six, which is A. So if you ended up, if you did what, what, what was normally thought of as a C sus six, you would have C, E, and A. Well, that's just an A minor chord. So you really wouldn't have, you would, if you wanted a C sus six, you would just say, hey, play an A minor chord. If you wanted a C sus two, you would say, oh, play an E minor seven chord. So that's why you don't see them very often. And that's why it ended up getting shortened to just C sus. Uh, because that just, there's only one of the susses that really makes sense, and that's C sus four. Um, and so C sus would be C F G. Now that's a little tough when you have two E's to take both E's up to F. Not brutally hard, but basically it would be this. Okay, which is a beautiful chord. I love that. So we're going to do X33011. So you got a little baby bar here on the first fret. Okay. Is this making sense? C Sussex. <laughs> exactly. I don't know if that's uh, that means something. Are we going to get... Uh, not yesterday... But the day before yesterday, I got a, in another one of those inappropriate for some advertisers, uh, uh, 
like it was a, um, oh, you know, a monetary, uh, like a monetizing hold. It, like you couldn't monetize that lesson. And I'm like, what did we, I didn't say anything, but it, you know, and sometimes I wonder if it's something that gets typed over here. Um, so Kathy's on the, on the lookout for that kind of stuff and just be, just be aware that, you know, avoid double anything that could be taken as a double entendre. Um, but the, uh, I always dispute it and then they have a human look at it or something that usually they, they approve it almost right away. So it's not really a big, big issue. It probably was the word pants. That's what I'm thinking too. Uh, and so I am wearing pants today. You can see. So, so we can, we might have to stop referencing that because I do think that that gets that gets that may be one of the triggers. Yeah, I know I didn't see anything inappropriate either, or and I didn't say anything. I don't think I try not to. You know me. Yeah. So, dear, we've got pants confirmed. Um, so, does that make sense? That really, CSUS, um would just be. A C, you know, like if I were playing C bar chord like this, here's the third. I only have one third in this form, the A form. So that's a not easier than this. Um, but it all but it but you don't have to move two notes, you only have to move one. Okay. Now if you played C like this, which I really like playing this way, getting that G on top. Okay, that's another way to play G or C. It's a four-finger chord. If we do that, then that's also a very nice C sus chord. We got a lot of sus chords here. Okay, so then that would be C sus. And it's a C sus that we'd only have to. I know they they don't really go into detail, Kathy. I don't know, but it, again, when I, I I ask for a review and they always give it, they always give me approval. So a new sweater, yeah, it's not. It's a very old sweater. <laughs> I'm running out of clothes to dimmer clothes to wear for you guys. So that's a that's a great chord. Um, it's a little bit like you know a hard day's night chord, um, G sus seven or something. Um, it's actually there's a was it was it hard day's night that they did a somebody did an analytic breakdown like analyzed the 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 um audio and determined what instruments were playing what notes and it's really fascinating i'll see if i can find that video maybe we can post that yeah i just love having it's it's you know one of the things in music theory when you learn music theory one of the things they tell you to avoid is having two thirds in a voicing uh because be, the reason and again this is music theory this is like college stuff or high school theory um and Rock music in particular and pop music and all this stuff ignores all the rules, basically, uh, because parallel parallel octaves and fifths are a no-no. That's called bad voice leading. But but I dare you to find a rock song that's not parallel fifths and octaves. So pretty much all those rules have been ignored. Uh, but when you have two E's or two thirds in a chord, oftentimes they're both going to have to move in a parallel manner to resolve. So if I had a C chord and I went to F chord, both of those E's went up to F, which is a very natural resolution. It's part of the... It's part of the natural occurrence in there, but a good voice leading would be maybe to do something more like this, where you have one E, so you have one note going up, and then this G goes down to F. And that that's better voice leading in college, okay? In music theory class in college. Uh, it's not the real world. The real world doesn't really follow those kind of rules. Although I really try to sometimes when I'm writing because I find that the re the rules are there because of hundreds of years of of uh, the rule, you know, of of uh, experience and you know, hundreds of years of music and analyzing music and going, well, what music works and what music doesn't work. But again, it comes down to rock and roll, which has been around for you know, sixty years, sixty five years, and um, the parallel fifths is and parallel octaves are very, very common in rock music. So yeah, Bach made all the rules. Oh yeah, it's cold here for me anyway. <laughs> um, so anyway, we have, so that's a sus, we got different C susses, okay? Now, so, so basically we have a C triad, right? 
And the C triad um, was C, E, G. So that was a root, a fifth. I'm sorry, third and a root. I mean, a fifth. Dang. I'm still thinking power chords. <laughs> My brain. Okay. So when, when we did C sus four, okay, C sus or C sus four, we just went C, F, G. We got rid of the E, okay? Now, I, I don't remember ever seeing this written. Um, but I, I've called this chord, this next chord, C4 for quite a while. Early, though, it was called C add four. So you have the C. I don't know if you can see this. I'll be get a little closer here. So because some of you are watching on. Yeah, rules are totally made to be broken. That, I mean, that's kind of the thing. A lot of the great music broke the rules. And then other people came along and explained why it worked and why we have new rules now. <laughs> that's, that's just the way it is. Uh, so, okay. So. There's C sus for, or C sus is C, F, G, one, a root, four, and five, okay? But I call, there was another thing, a chord called C add four, which you more commonly called, or saw C add two was a very common chord, or add two chord was very common. We're going to talk about that one next. Uh, but C add four would be C, E, F, and G. It would be a C triad, the C part here, okay, the root, the third, and the fifth, and then you'd throw a four in there. Um, I just do a shorthand on that. I call that, I call it C4. Isn't that some kind of explosives or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> Chris, you tried that with your parents. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the context is everything. In the arts, it works in the, in uh, life, not so much. I tried it with the uh, freeways. I was telling Beth, we, we want to go to England again. And, and my, my daughter may be moving there uh, soon. And uh, um, we uh, uh, we're thinking about, Oh, you know, it'd be fun to go to, to, to London. And then she will be in, uh, I think, I think it's Birmingham, Birmingham. And I would love to go to Liverpool. And then we have some, I have a friend up in Scotland. I would love to go up and see, he's got a kind of a, farm up there. And uh, uh, I thought, well, we could drive, but I'm like, I've been real paranoid about driving in Europe or anywhere out of the country. And uh, so I, I think we could practice, you know, the roads are pretty empty right now. So we could totally practice here in California, practice driving on the left-hand side. <laughs> okay. So C, what I call C4, you could call C add four would be a C chord with a four added. All right. This is different than a C11. All right, we're gonna. I'm gonna explain that. We're gonna get further into that tomorrow in the next days. Okay. Uh, so, so what we would do then, if we wanted a C and an, I'm sorry, an E and an F, it would be something like this. this is one way to do it. Okay. So I have. I'm nothing, it's X33020. So this chord, if I were to write out the notes, is would be C, F, G, C, E. It has all of those four, all four of those notes. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, now I could also take this E up to F and keep this E at E, and it would be this. And that's also a really cool sound, especially with lots of reverb. These chords sound great with lots of reverb. So that's C, that's this, and then, and that is almost a C, except for I'm laying my first finger down. Okay? That's, so I call that a C, that's a C4 chord. It's got the C triad and the four. Another way you could do it, I like, so right now we've got the E and the, the three and the four separated by almost an octave here, a little more than an octave here. And if I do it this way, if I did it this way, and I wrote this one out. Uh, so the other one, the, uh, sorry, the letter names are C, uh, what was it? C, E, G, C, F. So you can see I've got the C, E, G triad, and then we've got the F in there as well. It's a great 
great chord. I really love that chord. Well, I'll give you a good example of how we could do it so that we could have that F and E right together. Check this one out. Isn't that beautiful? So what I'm doing there is, again, nothing on the bottom. I'm going this. Now, the nice thing about it, it looks like I'm doing the A form bar chord. Look, you know, the A shape. But I'm not. I'm doing, actually got my first, I'm just hitting one note with my first finger. I'm not barring. I've got a, the first string open. So it's this. X, three, five, five, six, open. And that's, that's another, that's a C4. What, you know, again, I would call it C4. And on keyboard, this is very easy. You just play the C note, the E note, the F note, and G, you know, it's just, it's a very easy chord to play on guitar. I mean, on keyboards, but this isn't, this isn't difficult. I could also, yeah, there's, there's multiple ways to do it. I like this voicing. Let me go to my other sound here. It's a little more distorted, but. But I would, I like this. Could I borrow the first fret? Uh, what do you mean on the on this? If I just bar, if I bar this, that's just a regular C sus chord. If I open it up, then it's, I, I've never heard the term pumpkin chords, <laughs> but um, but yeah, you could bar on the first fret on that C chord, and that would be a C four chord, like that. That's what I'm doing. I'm actually barring. Um, but this voicing here, and it's basically I'm playing 10, 9, uh, 6, 8. And this is a bit of an adult chord. It's a little tough to play. And there's no fifth in here, but it's it's C, E, F, and C again. Oh, use the F. I could, but then it would end up sounding like an F chord. As soon as you take the C out of the bass, then it, it stops being C centric. Okay. So like I could do, you know, something like, yeah, but that's really, I'm going to think of that's definitely, I would call something that a G, a, an F major ninth chord. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely. And one thing I like to do is like, I'll bounce the pick. Especially with lots of delay. It sounds like an auto harp or something. It's not, oh, it sounds like a dulcimer, hammer dulcimer. It does kind of sound like that, doesn't it, Chris? You like that? Isn't that cool? So I, if I want to get like a pseudo hammer dulcimer sound, I try to get this, I try to get a half step in there, which is what that C4 chord, or yeah, the C4 chord gives me. And, I, and the, the nice thing about this chord is it's totally movable. All the other ones, we use some open strings. So, so if this is, here's a C, here's B4, here's B flat four, here's D4, here's E4. It's a pretty cool chord. So anyway, that's so that's the four. Okay, now a C sus two. If you were to take the C, say we take a C triad. I'm going to go back to my other sound. It's a little bit simpler. If we were to take the C triad and go like that. I wouldn't call that any kind of C chord because because the ear doesn't hear C. I mean, if there's a bass, exactly. Um, if there's a bass playing a C, then yeah, that would work. Okay, uh, you could you could use this as a C like a C two chord. But if the bass is playing, then it, it would be analyzed as a C two a C two chord anyway. Um, so what I if you take a C E G triad and move the C up a whole step, you get D E D whoops D E G. And that's kind of more of an, that's kind of like an E minor seven over D. Don't worry about it. No quiz. All right. However, the C, what I call the C2 chord, which would be a C triad. Okay. So a C2 chord would be, and, and back in the 60s and 70s, even into the 80s and 90s, we would call it a C add two. You remember the add two chords? Okay, so that would be C, D, E, G. Here's the root, the third, and the fifth, and there's the two. But I just call it a C2 chord, and now pretty much everybody just calls it a C2 chord. And there's a million of those. You know, we all know these. Now, 
here's one thing. Sometimes uh, <laughs> back in the day, if you just wanted C, D, and G, because see, a, a C sus two implies to me that you're moving the root up to the two. So you're losing the root. Just like we lost when we did a C sus four, we lost the three because the three went up to four. Um, this one <laughs> they called, I remember seeing this and I was like, really? It would, sometimes they would call it C add two and then in parentheses, no third. And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? It's like the easiest chord in the world to play. It has the longest name. It's one of those really deceptive. And then they kind of started doing C two, no third. Um, and the reason you might say no third um, it is, well, for one thing, if there is no third, so if I played um, this, that's a C2 with no third. So that's just, so I'll, I'll write it out here. X, three, X, I'm muting a string, open, three, three. And this could be, I would still call this a C2, is what I would call it, but you could call it C2, parentheses, no third. If you really did not want anybody to play the E. Sorry, Kathy. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, DK, I'm going to call you DK, okay? I'm not going to try to pronounce your name. Um, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's. I, I, I always say, Kathy, well, you know, everybody won't say, has heard this a million times. There's no quiz at the end of the week. And usually what I mean by that is, look, you, you don't have to be able to teach this. You don't have to be able to completely understand it. Um, I always I always use the example of when I was a kid and I subscribed to Guitar Player Magazine. And the first time I read it cover to cover, uh, when I was a kid, I got my first issue. I understood maybe 10%. And then the next month, I understood maybe 12% and then 14%. And the more you start to hear these terms, um, I'm, I try to be very consistent with my terminology. Eventually, they'll start to sink in. And I'm really trying to keep things pretty simple. Um, but like I said, with the E minor seven over D, there's no, don't worry about that. <laughs> it's just not going to be, you're not going to be asked to do something where it's like, oh, could you do a sus, sus C chord, sus two? So we end up with, an, you know, it's not, no one's ever going to say, it. I'm trying to, I'm trying to put this, make sure you understand this, but understand it in a way that's most commonly used in most notations. Um, so anyway, so D, it's okay if I call you DK. <laughs> I hope so. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Yes. Yes. Sorry. And I, I need to get closer. You guys can do a quick screenshot of this. This is just me kind of take, you know, this is like me being the college professor with a whiteboard. I'm just kind of writing things down as I'm saying them. It's, this isn't necessarily stuff that you need to, <clears throat> to go on. And you can see where I could get in a little trouble here if I'm going to do all of the, um, uh, the all four five chords of the cage method. You can see where I'm going to run into time issues because we're not even done with C, and I'm at thirty. I'm at thirty minutes. So, hey, we haven't seen Pepper yet. Did she lose her uh, electricity? I wonder. Wait a minute, is she here? Anybody seen Pepper? Because I know they had she had tornado warnings and stuff like that, or tornado yeah watches probably. Hey, Max. Sorry, I'm just scanning to see if we have Pepper. I don't see her. I hope she's okay. Uh, I knew that she was. They, she sent me the screen cap of the warnings for their for yesterday. Um, and then she also had a migraine because of the barometric pressure change. We've all had those before. Okay, so um, so let me give you some C2s. Okay, uh, that was one I gave you. Here's another one. Just taking a C chord and add your pinky here. I do that one a lot. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll still put the X there. Just I think that helps. Okay. And the, the letter names here are C, E, G, D, and E. Oops. I need a space in there. Um, and so you can see we have the triad, C, E, G. And then we have that second. There's the second, the, the D. Oh, she was here. Oh, good. Okay. And then you have the E on top. So we got that. We got that D, that two, three relationship, which is nice. That whole step right there, it's nice. Now, if we want to get rid of that, we can play it like this, which a lot of us do. This is probably the most common C2 because we come from G, like a four finger G chord, go to that C chord and it's technically not a C chord. 
It's a C2, and that would be, um, hold on, let me put an X. C, that one. You guys have played that one before, right? You can catch it, yeah, you can catch up later on. So. so there's a C2. And that, again, could be the same as C add to. If you've heard the term C add to or D add to or G add to or whatever, it, um, in this case, in this context, I am implying a that there is a, a third in here. If I say C2, I want I probably want to hear the third. Um, another way you could play it like this, uh, X35533. Three, five, five, three, three. And if we analyze that, it's C, G, C, D, G. Well, there's no third in this one. But if I was in A and I did that... I could hammer on the, the third. If I played it with these three fingers, I could hammer on the pinky, get that third in there. But see, without a third, it could be a minor chord. It could be a major chord. Okay? And that's why you would use that no third addition to the, the, the suffix to the name of the chord if you really didn't want someone to play a third. Because we could be in... That's a C2 chord, but there's no third in there, so we don't know if it's major or minor. Sounds like an 80s song. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Nine is equal to two, but when we talk about ninth chords, we're actually talking about five note chords. When we're talking about two chords, we're talking about a triad, which is three notes plus the two. When we talk about, and we're going to get to this, and so this will make sense, but when we talk about a ninth chord, a ninth chord will have a root, a third, a fifth, a seventh, and a ninth. And you can think of it as a two. It's the same note, but we wouldn't, a two chord would not contain the seventh. I got to be careful not to put down too many fingers. <laughs> so, you know, a two chord would be C, E, G, D, and a, a, C, a, a C, C two chord would be C, E, G, D. And a C major ninth chord would be C, E, G, B, D. Okay, but we're, that's going to make more sense when we when we start working on ninth chords. But that's why we don't call it. And, and that's another one. You you might also have seen this. You I, I remember seeing In fact, this is how I used to write it. And, I, and then I, I got, I kind of changed. But I used to write it C add nine. I forgot about that. Some of this stuff goes so far back, it's hard to even remember. But C add nine was another common name for C2, what I would call a C2 chord. Okay. Does that make, does that make sense? Hey, DK just changed his name to DK. <laughs> Every day I've been doing it at 11 o'clock California time, uh, Los Angeles time. So that would be 2, 2 p.m. So 11 a.m. Um, so you're only a half hour late, basically, DK. Um, and so it depends on where you are. Uh, but if you're in England, it's going to start. Um, uh, it's going to start at uh, if you're in London, for example, it'll start at seven o'clock. I think, Dennis, it's eight o'clock where you are. Right. In Holland, it's eight o'clock. Is it eight? Are you guys nine hours ahead of me? I can't remember. I was just there. Um, yeah. And if you look at older music charts, you're right, Rick. It can it can be like <laughs> you look at older charts and you're like. Wait, D add nine, what the heck is that? You know, so, but that's what they're talking about. But you're right, it could be called a nine or two, but we're really, because of the way I like the way this looks, you know, because when remember when we wrote out two octaves, we could see then the seventh, the ninth, uh, the 11th and the 13th, it started to fall into, into place there. Um, and so that's kind of why I like going back to the two, four and six for these chords. And we're gonna talk about the sixth chord next, but so. Uh, yeah, it's um, like um, every breath you take is two chords. I think it starts on A flat. But this is root, fifth, two, and third. It has all three, all three notes right there. Oh, did I touch my face? I probably did. Sip. Okay, so we have a drinking game. I see 52 people on board, so I think that probably there are some of you who don't know our drinking game. Uh, if I touch my face... If I refer to myself in the third person, 
if I say I had a band in high school called something, um, or if I pick up a guitar and I don't realize it's in an open tuning and I start playing in standard. Okay, so cheers. I touched my face. We need another one though, because I don't think we're getting dehydrated enough. We need, but somebody suggested when I, if I forget to turn on the light, I, I, I actually turned on the light today because I didn't want you to have to take a sip. <laughs> If I, no glasses don't count. If I push up my glasses, sorry. You, if I did these glass, these are my computer glasses, and they're really loose. So I'm constantly touching my glasses. So I don't think we could do that, or or Verdi would be on the floor within about 30 minutes. <laughs> He'd be laying down, and I don't see Verdi. Has Verdi made an appearance yet? Every time I change guitars, that could happen. We could do that. It's a natural break anyway, so you might as well take a sip. Um. doing there i'm taking the c chord and i'm going c to c sus to c to c two there's no third in there so you could say c add two or c add nine you, you hear it all the time i mean in, in, in on the d, d chord on stairway to heaven that's d2 to d to d sus Okay, um, and uh, to to kind of make your point, uh, who said that? Uh, I forget. Was that who said? Uh, sorry, you guys are chatty. Oh my goodness! Yeah, India is, has that half hour thing. Too. Well, in India, there's also parts of I think uh, Russia that have. Okay, so it's plus. Oh my goodness! Oh no! Wait a minute! No, it's. Here, oh, I see you got that half hour thing going, but yeah, it's not PM, it's AM. You're you're just after midnight your time, right, DK? Or plus, oh, you're plus five uh, five and a half hours from Greenwich Mean Time, I think is what you're you're saying. Plus, yeah, plus three five thirty. That means over Greenwich Mean Time. So you're, yeah, you're late. It's late. No, it's no. You were right, Kathy. It's it's. I think he's. It's tomorrow already. <laughs> in India like we're we're on Monday he, they're on Tuesday already I believe if I could be wrong if you're in India DK I'm not sure uh but but uh yeah that makes sense sorry we're kind of getting sidetracked on time zone issues okay so um we've done the the four and the two let's do the six so basically what we've got is a triad is going to be again CEG and if we if we were to suspend the six, okay, if we were to suspend the six, meaning we got rid of the fifth of the triad. So like C, there's the triad, C, E, G. So it's X, three, two, zero, X, X. And that's basically C, E, G. If we were to do the suspension thing, if I do air quotes, that could be a drink. <laughs> How about that? Is that that I want I want some upvotes on that. Do we do we uh, do we do we include in the drinky game air quotes? I love on Friends how Joey when he couldn't get air quotes right. I love to say air quotes like that whenever I say air quotes. Okay, so well, Ab Ab is voting for Kathy is voting. Okay, everybody's voting for. Okay, yes, exactly, Max. C add nine is C two now. C nine is a different chord. And C add nine is just too much to write. So C2, see, we're lazier now than we were in the 60s and 70s. Uh, we're always looking for shorthand. And trust me, there are some of these things that I write that are that's really originated for me just writing for me so that I knew because I was writing music. I wasn't necessarily doing it uh, for anyone else. And then I just it just kind of migrated into my teaching. Um, so that's basically that. But it, it, if you were to see, I, I've never seen really the, the chord C sus six. Um, and again, I've, I've never seen that. Um, but the implication is that you take the five up to the six. If we did that, we'd end up with this chord, which is X two. It's a cool chord. I like this chord. Um, in fact, I think I used it in Home to Mama. Uh, I'm not Home to Mama. I used it in, I used it in uh, Yellow Raincoat with Bieber. I went. Uh, 
So what is it? Hey, they're right there. Now I'll probably get a takedown notice for that for a, a, a hook that I actually wrote. <laughs> but but this this uh, this chord I'm playing here is a, is basically I would I call it a D six. I wouldn't call you could you could call it a D. D add six, but basically what it also is is a B minor with a D in the bass. So that's what I'm saying. So this shape here, which is so the, the, that D minor shape that I was or that D shape that I was playing um, was uh, basically X five four four and an X X is basically that's I, I basically would call that a D six. There's no fifth in it. You don't need to have a fifth in a six chord. But um, so um, so in C, if I went there. You know, I, I would call that a C6, but you harmonically speaking, C, E, A is really just an A minor triad. Okay. Um, so we just, we just would call that a C6. I just call it C6 because we want to see in the bass. But a C6, and C6, if you have a G in it, so if you went C, E, G, and A, which is what I, what I would do. If I could, if it, if, it, if I can get a G in there, um, so C six, C six. Again, I'm gonna hold this closer again, Kathy. Okay, C E G and then an A. All right, and that could be a, like a jazz chord or something like that. But that would be basically, you know, you have your root, third, fifth, and there's your sixth. Okay, so my point being that. If we take a triad like this, C, E, G, and we play C, D, E, G, we're adding the two. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. Um, if we, so this is be basically C2. If we add, if we went C, E, G, and added the four, oops, dang it. <laughs> I wrote a four instead of F. I wrote it. Uh, it doesn't even look, now it looks like an A. Fudge. Okay. All right. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm going to get, I'm not, that's not going to be friendly for advertisers. I just said fudge. Okay. And then if we had C, E, G, and the six, which is A, <laughs> so that would be a C4 and this would be a C6. Like that. So all, the C2, C3, and C4 all have a triad, and then they just add the C, the two, four, and six. And C sus4 would be different. C sus4 would not have the third. Fudge is copyrighted, yeah. I had a band in high school called Is Fudge Copyrighted? <laughs> yeah, Dennis, it's funny. It's actually the, the, uh, the kids used to be impressed with that. Now they're more impressed that I do the guitars and write on uh, uh, Apex Legends. <laughs> The 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 uh, game the game all the gamers out there are like what you played all the guitars I got a nice shout out from oh who was it now I can't think it was uh, one of the big DJs it was like he loved the guitars on that record I'm like well then hire me Co yeah I, yeah I said copyrighted fudge is the name of my high school band I only had one band in high school and it was named Rendezvous remember we talked about that the other day. Yeah, DJ. Yeah, that's yeah. I play all the guitars on that. Well, and it, actually, you, I play a lot of noises and weird stuff on. It. I have a lot of fun working on that with Stephen Barton, and um, probably, probably about eighty percent of the music that I create on, you know, the stuff that I create on there doesn't sound like guitar. I'm mostly just like going crazy with, you know, like one of my favorite things to do is. Um, where's my e boat? Oh, here it is like playing Ebo and slide at the same time. So I got a slide on one hand and an Ebo in the other, and I'm just like. <laughs> it's kind of making like crazy sounds, you know, and with lots of reverb or delays or flange or chorus or weird stuff, you know, all sorts of weird stuff. It can create some really cool effects, but it's fun, fun for me to do that. Vanilla alarm clock. Now you're just trying to say funny things over here, so I'll say it. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get me to say it. Rendez Vows, exactly. But you can't take a drink on that because I actually did have a band in high school called Rendez Vows. So. 
Yeah, Ebo's are fun. I use it. I use it a lot in the studio. Live, it's not. You know, I like this trick, I, David. You know this one, like just make a D minor chord and go to the neck pickup. You have to go to neck pickup. <laughs> It's kind of cool to get that kind of that cello concerto thing going uh, with the ebo, but you kind of gotta you gotta kind of put it over the neck pickup. It gets a lot more. It just, it just kind of, I'm actually it's touching the strings. That sounds like an accordion. That's so funny. <laughs> I guess it could kind of sound like an arpeggiated accordion. Okay, so we've we talked about this now. Um, we, we basically there's basically four chords that we learned about. Okay. Oh, I need to give you some C6 examples. Okay, let me do that. Because I gave you some C4, some C2, and some C sus. The four chords are and in short, the shortest hand possible, C sus, which is C, F, G, no third. C, two, which is C, E, G with a D, which is the second. C, four, which is C, E, G with the fourth, which is F, C, E, G, F. And C, four is not a very common chord because it's dissonant. It's got that, I mean, I like I said, I think it's beautiful. I love the sound of it. I love the sound of C, four. Um, but it can be clashy. It has it has that minor second or that half step, that E to F, right? So, um, and then uh, we also learned C6. Now, let me show you some of those. Here's one. Again, there's no, so this one is X, Three two two one zero, and it's C E A uh, C E. So there's no fifth in here. So you could also some somebody might go, "Why are you playing an A minor chord?" It's kind of A minor over C, is because C here's your A minor, and add your pinky. Okay, you could also call that A minor over C. Let me see if I can get a. Here's one. So I go uh, X three and then. Bar my pinky there, and that's C, G, C, E, and A. So this one is a C6 chord that does have a G in it. So there's a fifth in there. But that was a little tough. Uh, let me see if I can find one that's uh, got the G in it. Um, hmm. Hard to do one here that has a G in it, to be honest. Yeah, I just, I, I'm not seeing it. Like if, I, if I'm in open position, I want to play a six chord, I'll just do this one. Yeah, it's, that's not quite right. So um, I could put G in the bass, but then it just sounds. Now here's, a, well, here's another thing. So if you bar, bar with me the fifth fret, and you're basically going to, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the. It's probably a good thing you can't post live pics in the chat. <laughs> oh, did I do? Did I touch my face? Okay, so if we bar here, let me just go X X five 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 X. Okay. Well, you know, maybe if I put triple X in there, that's what <laughs> triggering something. If I accidentally do that. Um, so you do that. Okay, these notes right here. I love it. It's real. You can see it in G2, but I'm going to do it right here so you can see it in the key of C. Okay? So do get your hand right there so you can so I'm trying to make you stop typing. That would be G, C and E. All right? Yeah, it's a magnet. Oh, you talk about this thing. Yeah, it's like magnets or something. Things been around since the 60s. I mean, the guy that invented it still owns the copyright, and he shows up at the NAMM show. He's a really old guy now, and he does amazing things with it. He just sits in his booth and plays Debo. Uh, it's pretty crazy. 
and they're not a horrible expensive. I think this is the two octave one. So I can go up and down, uh, not up. I can go up one octave and up two octaves. On it, so it's got a double switch. I mean, I think they're like 80 bucks or something like that. Here, <laughs> I'll create an Amazon link. <laughs> Tom's always trying to profit off of us. He's all about the money. That's, I don't know who's talking right now, but let me see if I can find an Evo on. At the very least, so you can look at it. Evo for guitar. Yeah, there's really only, I mean, oh, they're 100 bucks now. Snap. Um, let's see. Let's find the one that has the best reviews. The probably the best. Yeah, and they look different than mine. Mine's like a light gray. These are like a darker gray. Uh, some of these come with batteries. It does take a nine volt. So I'm generating a text here so that you can click on this and go look at it. You don't have to. Not for sale in Canada. Yeah, but I, I just think that I, I probably haven't bought one in a long time, or maybe I paid 99 bucks for this one. I don't remember. I mean, I've had this one a long time, so it, there's really nothing to it. There's no moving parts. It's just what always happens. You have to be very, uh, and I'll tell you, if you're going to get one, be very careful. The uh, the connection, uh, the battery thing here is always, that that connection there, I've, I've broken it already and had to fix it and everything. So that that's you got to be careful when you take the battery off and on do it very gingerly so you don't break the wire because the wire is very tiny on that. So that would be my only. Uh, yeah, it said ninety nine dollars right, right now. So, oh, is that what you paid for yours? Yeah. Like I said, I probably had this one for fifteen years, uh, and I may have had another one before this, and it just died or whatever, or I lost it. Probably left it at a gig. Is probably what I did. Um, so. Um, but yeah, it's a kind of a fun, fun tool. So anyway, back to our little bar chord here. The reason I'm having you do this chord is because here we can see all of the, the, the we have, I told you before, uh, it's G, C, E, or you can think of it as five root and third. Okay. So check this out. If I go here, basically make a minor shape, right? That looks like an A minor chord. It's really like a D minor chord. Okay, if I make that shape on top of that, above it, so it'll be X7, oh wait, X, X, 7, 7, 6, X, okay? That's A, D, and F, all right? So here's A, D, and F. Well, A is the sixth, D is the two, and F is the four, okay? But you could do any one of those. You could do, if you wanted the four, the, the four suspension. You could do the two. You could do the six. In fact, the six is really common. Okay, the, the, the four is very common. Right? Um, but I could do any one of them. Let me do the two and the four. Okay, so now we're talking, we're in, we're in Keith Richards' territory here. Because remember, well, you may not know this, but Keith Richards tunes his guitar. Um, I'm changing guitar, so we're going to get to take a sip. Uh, I don't want to tune that one. I, I, I'll see. Okay. I'm just going to go ahead and tune the Martin to open G. You don't need to do this. You don't need to do this. I'm just going to show you what's, what's going on here. Everybody take a sip. I changed guitars. So now I'm playing... Basically, I'm, I'm not. I'm trying not to hit the bottom strings. So I'm playing. I'm open, I'm tuned to open G, which is D G D G B D. Okay, but I'm really trying not to hit the bottom string. So I'm really kind of trying to do D G uh, D B B. Okay. 
Okay, so if I want to do, if I want to do a sus, here's the here's the um, so it's a G. The triad is GBD. The the um, the six is the, this E here. This is the two, and this is the four. Now Keith Richards would rarely hit all all three of them at the same time, but he would do two a lot. He would do the the six and the four. So you, I could just do the two, the four only. So here's, here's, here's how you play in open G. Here's how you play G. Got five zeros. Yeah. Here's how you would play G. Sus. It's zero, 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 one, zero. Super easy. Yeah, Bob, he would remove the low E. I actually had a guitar set up that way, but I, I don't have it set up. I used, uh, David, I used to have my Dan Electro set up that way. I, had, I just had four, five strings on it because uh, it had really cool, especially for slide. It was that the Dan Electro sounds great for slide with those lipstick pickups. I don't know what it is. It's like, you know, that where's I don't have a metal slide out. Where's my metal slide? It's weird. I have this this one, but. Uh, you know, the metal on, on the strings and the metal underneath the strings and just something about it. This is a really cool sound. Um, so, yeah, so that's G and then this is G sus. And then I could do G. Now, it gets a little confusing now if I say, okay, G sus four and six, you know, whatever. You could say G four six or something. I don't know. But but basically, if you did this, um, X zero two zero one two. Okay, and keep in mind, I'm not necessarily suggesting that you do open tuning. What I'm trying to say is, here's how suspended chords or twos, the, the two, four, and six can be played out on top of the one, three, and five. Okay, here's the one, here's the two, here's the three, here's the four, here's the six, or five, six. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, but sometimes Keith would do would do the um, this note, the two, and the four. Question. <laughs> That's a loaded question. Uh, how do I start off playing guitar? Uh, well, if you have a guitar, start there. Um, I would, if you can, of course, not right now, it's difficult to start that, but I would try to take some private lessons to get going. Because a teacher can look at what you uh, can can help you kind of direct you into things and watch your technique. It's really difficult. Um, I can't see your technique here. Um, so uh, bu, 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 I see a lot of. Yeah, it's weird to take sips without verting. Hopefully he's OK. He'll probably watch later. Um. So, but as far as getting started, I, I, I always, you know, really recommend um, trying to get a private a teacher. And you know what? Don't commit if it, if you take a month's worth worth of lessons, you know, four lessons, and um, you uh, you're not it's not a good fit. Then then maybe ask to change teachers or go to a different store. Now, if you can't afford to take lessons, uh, Justin Guitar on YouTube is pretty good. They have lessons much better organized than I have. I have a playlist. I can send you a link. I can put a link up here for you. A uh, uh, basic lessons that I've been doing. Playlist that I kind of created um, right after um, I did that video. That's so big of mine. The ten or the seven tips for older beginners. So that thing is just blown up. I think I got two million views of that now. Um, but here's a playlist that I created after that, that I started realizing, okay, I probably should do stuff that's a little bit more, has a wider um, audience. Um, so, uh, so that'll help. Oh, okay. Oh, and questions. Okay. So are we understanding what I'm doing here? But, you know, and I don't know that Keith is thinking, oh, I think I'll do a, well, I can't do a good British accent. I'm going to, I'm going to get lambasted for the, uh, but I, I, you know, I think I'll do a six, six, four suspension. Now, I don't think he's thinking that, but that would be that one. So I'm, I'm doing six, four suspension would be basically this zero, two, zero, one, zero. Keeping in mind, I'm not playing the bottom string. 
Um, and if I want to do, I could do a two and four. So that would be zero, zero, two, one, zero. Yes. That's uh, um, in, in the key of A. He's not using, he's in, he's in, um, not an open tuning. That's uh, John Mellencamp. Okay. So, Kathy, you're telling me, thank you, Kathy, so much. Kathy can't even learn anything because she's so busy <laughs> working for me. Poor thing. Uh, let's see. All right. Question. Yeah, but there was further one. Question from Ira and higher up from Dennis. Okay. Ira, where are you? I'm scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Keep that live chat scrolling, 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 scrolling. Uh, live chat. Dang it, Ira, where is your... Who, wait, who did he say? I got into my song and I probably... Got, yeah, John Cougar, that's a, that song. Uh, but not not the Rolling Rolling Rolling. Rawhide. Uh, yeah, Hide Raw. Oh, no. Now we're not going to... See, see, what you said, East End, that's going to be... That may be cause a problem right there. You may have to delete your own... <laughs> Yeah, no, it's always hard to interact with you. That's exactly right, but it's fine. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's see. Uh, so Ira, where's I? Oh, 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 wait. Oh, Ira, right there. When were you? Uh, when you were at the fifth fret and bar hammer on? Is that Hendrix Quartet? Um, yes, he would do that a little bit. He really liked the E form chords more than the the A form, but he would do the A form. Yeah, I mean, I I, I I'm going to change guitars again, so take a sip. So just watch my hands here. Not wash, watch. I washed my hands already. Um, so here's that C C chord. There's the fifth fret, right? I'm doing that I'm actually seeing this triad right here I see oh that's the third so I'm going to the four and then I'm seeing the root and there's the two and here's the fifth and here's the six five six one two three four and then sliding down to the root Is that G chord. So that if that answers your question, yeah, Hendrix would definitely use that kind of that kind of thinking, and he would pl play that chord, and then he would he would be playing the suspensions on top of it as hammer-ons, hammer-ons and pull-offs. Basically, that's what you know. You you want you know suspension should suspend and then resolve. It should it, suspension no matter what. I mean, we think about the the Who song, right? It's suspending and then resolving, and that's like a a C sus to a C, C, C chord. And again, I say sus. Okay, so now, Kathy, there was another one. Uh, Dennis. Oh, Dennis. Kathy missed mine. Let's see. Lessons about amp usage. Uh, is that what you were asking? Let's see. Um, let me see if I can find the original question. Oh, Tom, doing any amp lessons too? Uh, Dennis, I'm, I, I guess I'm not... Oh, you have no clue. You know what? Just look, just Google, uh, go to YouTube and enter the name of your amp. And I'm sure there's 50 guys that have done uh, reviews. I'm not really known as a review guy. Um, and to be brutally honest um, about myself, um, I am not like, tone, I was never the tone guy. Um, growing up, I like there were guys that got into gear and I had friends that would do this. I was more like, okay, I need to learn this technique. I need to learn how to do this thing. And, you know, um, and so it, it's kind of interesting because the, the, those two personalities tend to split off in two different directions, right? Like the, the tone guys ended up doing more records because records are a much slower process. I mean, if you, if you read about like Fleetwood Mac and even Steely Dan, how it would take sometimes months to do a record. They could spend weeks on one song. Um, it could be all about getting that perfect tone. And it's like, okay, let's try this amp. Okay, let's try this amp. Steve Ray Vaughn was very much into that kind of thing. Very much a tone guy. My son, Alex, is a very much a tone guy. And he knows all about that kind of stuff. He knows, and and I'm the guy that buys a guitar. And if I don't like the pickups, I just put it in the closet until maybe someday I will like the pickups. Whereas the tone guys would change the pickups out four or five times. Um, now, 
to that end, I still feel like I have pretty good tone, but most of the time when I'm using amps because I'm working on TV shows, movies, and games, I'm using amps inside the computer. I'm using software amps in the DAW. We've talked about this before, the digital audio workstation. Um, so that's kind of where, you know, I'm, I, it's like, for me, it's so often when I'm working, it's, I'll, I'll get a stack of, like I showed you, I mean, I did, here's just a bunch of cues that I did. You can see all this music and I literally had to play all of this in a couple hours. So it's really about getting sounds fast. And if I have to go into another room, dial up a tone, move a microphone a little bit, maybe move some baffles, um, and then then plug it in, try to get a sound. It's just not going to happen. So the beauty of the 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 uh, having the um, the amps using amps in your computers, I can save a sound if I really like it. And I'll even save it with a whatever name. It may be a high watt for, and I may say for for my Strat or for GNL or for Squire or for whatever for the Rickenbacker. I have sounds specifically named for different guitars and different folders. So it actually really helps. Um, let's see. Oh, it's a Black Star. Yeah, that's a great amp, though. Black Stars are great. Now, I do have that being said, I do have a lot of amps. Um, one of the things I did do back in the 90s and 2000s was I, I kind of started collecting heads because I wanted to be that guitar player that I got called to do sessions where, you know, I'd bring five or six or seven different heads and we would tweak until we got the sound we wanted. Tim Pierce is that guy. Tim Pierce is a very much a tone guy and goes around with lots of, uh, you know, he would show up at a session. I've been to sessions where he was at and he'd be playing, you know, he'd have five or six heads or more. Um, and so that was kind of, in some ways, it was almost like this, I don't want to say machismo, but it was kind of one of those things like showing, you know, showing up with all the stuff. Um, and back, and sometimes like someone like Tim probably is going to get cartage, which means somebody's going to pick up the gear, take it to the session, set it up, and then he just shows up. Because he had so much stuff, there's no way he would, it would take half a day just to, to move it around between picking it up, moving it there, setting it up, then tearing it down. You know, usually guys would have somebody do that for them. So, okay. Uh, I've got a lot of solo tips. Um, uh, and we've, we talked about that. I, I think what, um, uh, uh, Lindbergh, um, what I would do is one thing you could do, what the, the, First thing I talk about when I talk about solo, when I'm thinking, when I'm soloing, I'm often thinking shapes, the cage method. And so in C, got C shape, A, G shape, E shape, D shape. So we did, how many lessons did we do? We did 12 lessons on the cage method to start this whole series. So if you go back to the very first lesson that, that I taught here, you're going to hear me talk about the cage method. And I use the cage method to both find chords up and down the neck and to find shapes to play in. So like when I'm soloing in C, just that alone right there, I was playing in four different shapes. I was playing in A shape, then I went up to the G shape, and then I went up to the E shape, and I ended up on the C shape. So all of those kind of start to, start to connect, and because the cage shapes all line up on the fretboard no matter what key you're in in that order if it's a then then it'll be g then e then d then c if it's start on g shape then it'll be g e d and so forth um that's a great place to start so i would go there um oh wait i'm, I'm losing i'm getting behind on some of these this chat <laughs> like i said i'm glad we're not doing like a zoom where i can hear all of you <laughs> Uh, yeah, I use computer not even 90% of the time, probably 100% of the time. Well, not live, obviously, but uh, I have friends that show up with laptops, though, and they'll run out of, you know, for live gigs even. I long time ago, I did a musical where the other guitar player, I was playing acoustic instruments, he was playing electric, and he had all the sound saved on his laptop. It was pretty cool. Um, but that's exactly right. Interface on a DAW. So you can look that up, those terms, and find out what to... Yeah, ultimately, it's for me, it's easier. It's just faster to use a computer uh, than to actually set up amps, all that stuff. Um, and how do you transition from chords to solo? Again, that's just kind of one of those things where you start bringing chords into, you know, you, uh, you what you can do is, uh, and I was kind of encouraging you guys to do this too, where when we were learning, uh, what, were we, what were we working on? I forget what, what it was, but like... 
you can do that with open chords. You play a G chord and, and then if you know that there, then you also know. Um, you can kind of start to see those shapes if you move them up and down the neck. It just it's much more difficult to play things up the neck than in open position because you you have it's like the 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 nut is an extra finger. So um, let's see. So I think I got the Lindbergh. How to turn it? Yeah, I got that. Thank you, Kathy. Oh, Kathy's giving me like little stop signs. You've been doing that for a long time. It helps me see that. Uh, Dennis, uh, David. Oh, David asked a question of Dennis. Uh, oh, Dennis, what amp do you have? Can it simply just be playing with each knob and listen to what you like? Yeah. And one of the problems with working with amps too is where I generally like to do most of my like amp uh exper you know experimentation sounds pedals in a big big room so if i'm in a rehearsal studio or at church generally i show up early at church if i want to kind of work on some stuff i get there an hour before everybody else so i can kind of crank up my amp and experiment with tones and and things like that so um it's really really hard to do that at home if if you have a house where you can crank it up but even then the room that you're, unless you've got a giant room the sound you dial up in a you know in a bedroom, even if you can, if no one else is home and you can crank it, or even like in a living room or something like that, it's going to be very different. It's going to sound very different than it, in a room where the walls are 400 feet away from you. I'm at my church. I don't even know. We it seats 3,500, so those walls are forever. <laughs> it's a, it's a whole different reverb thing. So it just really changes. I. One of the things I hate is uh, I hate the sound of reverb outdoors. And I, I use so much reverb on my sound that when when I play outside, I'm just like, oh, this reverb just sounds awful because outdoors, there's nothing for reverb. There's no reverb. There's nothing for sound to bounce off of. You know, all, you'll notice that all the reverb sounds are named for cathedrals or, you know, nightclub or small wooden room or small tile room or whatever. And it's because you, reverb's created by all this reflexing, ref, uh, the reflections happening on all the walls. It's why I have these panels up to cut back on reflections. I, if you look at my video, I did oh, what, what was it? I did a video. <coughs> excuse me. Um, uh, it was one of the first videos I did in this room, and I got a comment that you really should use a lapel mic because it's really boomy. And it, I listened to it, and I was like, oh shoot, especially with earbuds, you put it in. Um, so okay. So let's see what else have we got. So many comments. You guys are on fire here. Oh, by the way, um, <coughs> yeah. No, I now I know when you're doing the stop sign. I'll know. Now everybody's gonna do stop signs. <laughs> Everybody put a stop sign up there, and I'll be like, I'll just keep looking over at the screen. It's like. Um, but I appreciate that, Kathy. Um, yeah, I, I know the, the chat gets going pretty fast. You guys are pretty chatty. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, you could, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you, the, the church is, is the size of a town. Yeah, my church is like 10,000. And I think we online now we're averaging 20,000 just during the coronavirus, which is crazy. Uh, but I know people are all over the country watching our services. So and Alex has been doing most. So if you watch the services, you'll see sometimes me, but mostly Alex, because he needed the income because he lost so much work when this happened because he does a lot of live gigs. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, it's right, Jim. Doesn't that true? Outdoor reverb just sounds cheesy. It's just all, I don't know what to you just I guess you just turn it off. But that's hard if all your sounds have reverb. If you have a reverb pedal, then just don't use it. But in my thing, it, my I use my lexicon rig setup that I've been using since the mid 90s. Um, and I did a rig rundown on that a while ago in my in our old building. Um, you can see that. I could try to find that video. Oh, I know I can find it. Um, hold on a second. Um, and it was this guy that, <laughs> this guy that, uh, uh, let's see. Search across my channel, rig. So I think it's the only video. In, oh, I have two. Oh, right. Okay, well, that makes sense. Okay, my church rig rundown. Uh so I'll, I'll put a link here. You can see that. But again, that's that's not your, that's not, stop. It's not your, and I got a lot of down likes on this because people just a, either don't like the personality of the guy interviewing or me. Uh, but this is my, kind of my church rig rundown. You can check that out. Or they don't like the fact that I'm playing church, which is silly. It's like, 
Um, <laughs> he's like, I don't care if you're playing in, in you know, atheist concert hall. <laughs> it's such a thing. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, have I tried a Tonewood amp? Um, let's see. Let me make sure. I didn't see something before that. I have not. I don't think. Uh, I have not tried. Is that the one that goes on the back of the guitar or something? Acoustic guitar? I, can't, I see ads for that. And guys are like, oh, this is so cool. But I, those ads always, like, I'm always skeptical. They're basically infomercials. And they're, the people are either given stuff or paid to endorse. And I, you know, I tell you guys, I, I, I was using Elixir strings long before I was a quote unquote Elixir artist. I mean, I don't get a lot from them. I think I get a box of strings every year. So like I can get like 10 sets of acoustic or 10 sets of electric. And I almost every year forget to order it. Um, and I usually just order strings. Uh, oh, the experience of playing at the Canyon Club. Oh, thanks, Paul. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. That was a blast. I mostly played acoustic that day. Um, Andrew, uh, oh, Andrew, who, um, what's, what's Andrew's last name? He plays with, um, what's, uh, I can't think of anybody, Tom Hanks's wife's name. He plays with Tom Hanks's wife and he was in Australia and they got caught with the coronavirus. Remember, they had to stay in Australia. He had already, Andrew already was uh, do a little. Andrew, so Andrew Doolittle on that gig was the elect, made, did mostly electric guitar work, which is great because it kind of took the pressure off me. I could just bang away on the acoustic. Um, and then I played electric on a couple songs because Andrew wanted me to play leads. He didn't want me to like just play acoustic. He was like, he goes, I'd be bored if I just played acoustic. So I want to give you some stuff to do. So that was pretty, uh, that was pretty fun. So yeah, we're basically done with this lesson. Um, I'm putting down a guitar, but you can't take a sip for that. But I, you guys did not see me touch my face. I can't believe you missed that. Um, so let's see. Uh, hold, um, blah, blah, Alex. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll put, a, I'll put a link on that. You can check that out. Again, it's not the kind of amp anyone would get right now. In fact, the great thing about it, though, all the, the, my, my lexicon rig, I think the, the effects unit, which is actually where I get my amp sounds from, um, it um, was like 1200 bucks or 1500 bucks when it came out. The amp, which is a preamp, it's all tube and stereo power amp. It's a it's a it's a three amp, three watts per side, so it's not super loud, but you'd be shocked how loud it is. But that thing was also about twelve hundred bucks. And then the pedal board was like five hundred, and then the cabinet was like five hundred. I literally got everything because my previous rig, which was one of the refrigerator rigs, I spent so much of my time chasing hums. There was so much noise and things like that, replacing cables, running things, and I mean, I did everything the way you're supposed to do. And I just wanted some continuity. So this thing all did everything my rack did and then some. Um, and it was much, much quieter. So I really, really dug that. It was really because so many times, like I said yesterday, there was a, a one in composer that I worked for that. Um, in fact, it was, the, it was the week I got the rig. And I didn't know. It was the very week I got that rig. And I didn't know how to use it. And it was making noise. And I couldn't get rid of the noise. And he never hired me again. Um, so that's one of the things where engineers will really like, if you've got a lot of noise, things don't sound good or whatever, you know, if the producer says, Hey, what do you think of that guitar player? You'll go, eh. Um, uh, so you really kind of have to have all that together, but, but my, but I've been using the same rig, but you can find all those components now for like 300 bucks each or 200 or something, uh, which is crazy, but they're getting pretty old. Uh, the pedal board is the one I have mo many, I have three of everything except the pedal board. I probably have 10 of those. Cause I I'm always stomping on them and then I break them. And so I have them for parts. Um, yeah. You should, uh, DK, you should definitely work on the cage method. I think it'll really open up the fretboard for you. I think that's, and then, and then as you start to get familiar with each of the individual shapes, you'll find, and I do have a series on that. Um, I didn't really go super, super far on it. In fact, um, let me see. Um, find caged. What's the link? Okay, I, I did 13 videos of caged riffs that so the each of these are riffs that um are based in one of the shapes. So you can check this out. So check that playlist out. There's 13 there, and then I have other playlists. Uh let's see. All right, now where am I? Uh Uh, playing out, yeah, denial, anger, <laughs> depression, banana bread, acceptance, squirrel, Gary, <laughs> you're killing me here. So overall, Paul, the Canyon Club experience was great. Uh, 
CJ got me that gig. CJ is the the <laughs> is uh, he was MD for Joe Cocker for years, and he was MD for Spinal Tap, and he's he wrote all the music for Christopher all of Christopher Guest movies. He wrote the um, the score for and some of the songs. So if you're a fan of Christopher Guest, like um, Best in Show, um, kind of the Spinal Tap characters, but but uh, it was. Uh, Spinal Tap was directed by Rob Reiner and the, and then the Christopher Guest. I think the first one after Spinal Tap was uh, Waiting for Guffman. Is that right? That's a great, I love Waiting for Guffman. Well, that totally reminds me of my wife's hometown in Indiana. Um, headphone amp. Yeah, plug right. Just be careful. Yeah, it's headphone amps are great for practicing, especially late at night, but be careful. Go easy on your ears, okay? Uh, Tom is a world famous guitar teacher. No, I'm not. Although you guys, it's crazy. I got 71,000 subscribers now. It's really blown up since I started doing this. Um, do people get paid? Yeah. Yeah. I, I get paid to play in church. Um, uh, some churches don't pay. Um, smaller churches may, may not be able to afford to, but smaller churches, if they want a certain level of musicianship, they may have to. Um, so generally, yeah, you, I get paid, but I, I often don't, most weekends I donate my, my, uh, fee. Um, that way, uh, because I'm making money elsewhere, and so it's just part of my regular tie. Uh, the new Tom Terrific, whatever, Ira. <laughs> yeah, so DK, uh, do you want me to give you a link for that first video, or can you find it? I can, Kathy, you want to post a link for that first, the uh, daily lesson number one for DK, so he can start there. And then it's, it's 12 lessons in a row, so it's really. I go into detail, and there's a lot of this banter going on, <laughs> so I'm not sure it may not make for the best. Viewing. Somebody posted, I don't know, was that you, Iris? Somebody posted lesson, and it doesn't offend me when they do this, but somebody posts lesson starts at 220, or in the case of the daily lessons, like lesson starts at 15 minutes. I actually, somebody did that, and I'm like, that's very helpful. So I pinned that treat, uh, that treat, that uh, comment. I'm not offended by that. I do know that I talk too much. Um, generally when I do a video, when I sit down to do video, I'm pretty much thinking what I want to say. And I feel like that stuff that I say before the lesson is important. Um, but I understand for some people, they want to just get to it. So I'm, I'm going to try to make a habit of pinning any comment that says lesson starts here. I know it's kind of intended to be a little bit on the snarky side, but I don't take it that way at all. Cause I understand <laughs> How many videos have I started that I went, oh, get to the point? <laughs> it's just, and it's probably just because that person has a personality too much like my own. And I'm, I'm not going to, I'm like, ah, I don't like that person. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, Kathy, and your church, yeah, it depends on the church. Um, uh, it just depends. Some churches pay. We pay. The reason Shepherd pays is mainly because, and we have the same musicians every week. That's one reason. It's continuity. Um, and everybody or everyone in our on our team, all the players are very professional. Uh, Pee Wee Michiko, they toured for years with Sly, Stlo Sly Stallone, Sly Stones. Sylvester, uh, Sylvester. I keep saying Sylvester. it's Sly and the Family Stone. Uh, they're very good friends with Rose Stone, who was for a long time the choir director at Church on the Way in L.A. Uh, but Rose Stone is in, uh, if you've ever seen the movie, um, Woodstock, she's in that. She's up on stage with Sly Stone. Uh, they did a show there. Actually, it's a really good bit of the of the show. Um, I, Sly Stone's great. So Pee Wee Michiko, not only did they play with him, but Sly recorded many records at, his, at their house. Um, and they also toured with uh, Rufus, Shaka Khan, uh, and their daughter is a very well-known singer now, uh, Judith Hill. Look her up. She's amazing. Uh, she sang backgrounds for Josh Groban, but also Michael Jackson, her last record. This is their daughter. And she used to sing at my church. In fact, when I led worship, she sometimes sang backgrounds for me, which is ridiculous because I'm an awful singer and she's amazing. But she did her one of her records she and Pr Prince produced together. So that's pretty cool. And that was just recently, right before he died. So she's been heartbroken a couple of times because she was working with Michael Jackson when he died. She was the last person to sing and dance with him. And... Um, and then, and then she was, you know, working with Prince, and and Prince died. But uh, Walter, the drummer that you see over here, he all he does major movies, and uh, he's a, an amazing drummer and a percussionist. So he's working all the time. So everyone there is pro. So that's kind of why they kind of have to pay us to be around. And we do a lot of services. Like we would do five services. It would be hard. The singers are volunteers. The the worship leaders are not. 
Uh, but uh, generally, the singers are volunteers. Uh, but we have they have a lot of singers in rota rotation. Yeah, right. The the feedback is a big issue. I've had issues with that too. Uh, DK, you will always learn something regardless. Well, that's true. Um, so uh, I would know. Oh, uh, DK would like to know where in the learning cycle when to start caged method. Um, Believe it or not, I think that's something that if you're younger, I think it's something that can come in earlier than later. Um, also, just when you're younger, the thing is you, everybody wants to learn songs and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But if you can kind of learn, start like have a teacher show you songs and, and cage at the same time, then what can happen? Or if you're learning both at the same time, you can start to see how all these guitar players that you're idolizing and trying to learn their parts to, they're all thinking the car cage method. Whether they knew the name, I didn't know the, the term caged until much later. I knew it. I taught it, but I didn't. I never noticed that it spelled the word caged. And then I heard the term caged method. And I went, what the heck is that? And then when I saw it, I was like, oh, well, duh. Yeah, I've been teaching that forever. I just didn't call it that. Um, oh, tone, uh, let's see. Uh, sip, yeah, I think there was a sip in there. Frankie, uh, same Kathy. I studied at Hillsong, uh, Hillsong College, but I've never known anyone to get paid. Perhaps it's just travel expense for people outside church. Yeah, it just depends. I mean, every church I've worked at, they've pretty much paid me, but it's pro mostly been big churches. And, or I've been a worship leader. Um, I do I do actually want to do, I, I came up with like 10 tips for worship musicians, but they're more they're more uh, philo philosophical than musical and not, not so much skill tips, but more just like how to think about the gig, you know, what to do. Yeah, Rita Wilson, that's right. That's who uh, Andrew was playing with in Australia when they got, and he, he already got on the plane and was already home. And he had to go in quarantine. And, and, and Andrew's wife is a, a, I think she's an ER doctor. So I think he had to be in quarantine after being out of the country for like weeks. And he had to be in quarantine away from his wife for two more weeks. It must have been torture. Um, oh, might, might ask you some more later, David. Uh, Dennis. Oh, okay. Dennis, you guys, that to totally. I'm sure you guys are <laughs> connecting each other. Uh, my goal is to write a song like Phil Wickham. Yeah, Phil Wickham writes great worship songs. Um, let's see. Okay, we got, okay, so too busy talking. We're reading and typing again. Let's see, too busy watching chat to see Tom touch his face. Oh, I see. <laughs> uh, that's why you're not seeing me do it. Okay, Frankie got paid. I got paid when I traveled uh, to give my testimony uh, at another church. Kathy, oh, I, okay, cool. Yeah, I love offering. And I, I, have a, I have a cousin. She's a worship leader. And she goes around to churches and does her thing. And you know, you may actually make more money in that kind of, I mean, you've got to make a living. So it's like, you, you're not supposed to necessarily do something for free. You got to pay someone what they're worth. Um, and if you're asking them to be consistent or do it or provide a service for a church, not necessarily have, doesn't necessarily have to be for ministry. The pastors all get paid. So um, it's not, um, I, I use desktop monitors um, I, for sound monitors, Chris, uh, I just have Yamaha. I think I don't know which ones they are. I think they were the five-inch drivers, the bigger, they're the bigger Yamaha speakers. As far as monitor screen, I'm just using my iMac. Um, I just I, I don't have a you know, I don't have the trash can um Mac for, for doing recording because I'm I'm usually recording one track at a time. If I was recording, if I had a major studio and had uh, was doing 24 tracks at once or more, um, you would need a trash can or two. So you would need a bigger amp. Uh, okay, take a sip now, Kathy. Uh, well, that was probably 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just catching up. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, JBL makes pretty good speakers. Uh, there's a bunch of them. I'm, I wouldn't give recommendations personally. I actually got my Yamaha's from a friend of mine who has very, is a very, very good engineer. And he was just, he, had, he already had two very expensive. I mean, he, he paid, I think he paid 15 grand for the speakers he uses now for the pair. Um, but a couple speech sets before that, he sold me these for like, I think they go for 800 for the pair and he sold it to me for 400 because he just wanted me to have them. So, because we were working together a lot. So he wanted me to have decent speakers. Um, so smash, uh, oh, smash the like button. I got 33 likes. I, the other day, I got, yesterday I got like three dislikes, but that's because I didn't even teach. I uh, got to get Tom to 100,000. Well, I'm sure you're all subscribers. Uh, hey, Deej, uh, this guy, Scott Paul Johnson, goes pretty in-depth with the cage method. Oh, okay, great. 
yeah, check him out. Uh, I've not heard of him, but that's, you know, and, and that's the thing. I'm not spending a lot of time editing videos. Um, you know, some people make so much on YouTube that they can justify basically doing only that. I don't ever want to get to that place. I mean, I, I don't mind making money on YouTube, but I really, really kind of the reason why uh, I don't teach. Well, I don't teach privately anymore. And also because I don't why I don't teach. I've been offered teaching jobs at colleges and stuff. Um, I even got offered um, uh, a uh, teaching job at USC. Um, I could tell that story. I don't know. I, I, I hate to tell a story if Diane's not here. <laughs> that was that was a pretty crazy story. And I probably alluded to it in one pre, uh, previous video. But oh. Oh, that's the first. Thank you, Kathy, for posting that. Um, yeah, Randy, I think that first lesson, if that's the Randy uh, Lewis. Uh, yep, you got it. OK, I see that now. I time stepped for myself. Uh, that's the first lesson. And you're welcome. Thank you, Kathy. So on top of it. Um, Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times with YouTube, Deej, you're talking about, you know, a lot of times it's about connecting. And, and I know I rub people the wrong way, so they're not going to watch my videos. And then other people like my personality. So that's kind of it's just going to be that way. You're going to find someone who you really like. I mean, there are people that are really dry and some people really like that. There are some people that are very academic and people like that. There are some people that um, uh, they're just goofy and they have lots of things happening and flat. You know, I'm not going to do that. Uh, it's so funny because RJ. I don't know how he does it, but he has like a thank you thing that he hits and somebody gives some money. Like if somebody gave a dollar or something, he'd be like, thank you, you know, would show up. And I've seen some people do that. And I know it on Twitch, it's very common to see all this stuff going on on Twitch. Twitch is a little too much for me to handle. And that's why I really try with my videos to make it not, if I say, uh, I usually leave it in. <laughs> so it's not. So anyway, and then, you know, where it just does this edit. I try not to put those in there. So it's more like you're sitting with me and having a lesson. Uh, and that's what I think people like, especially people more my age. I, I think I, I I resonate with people my age because they're my age, but also because I don't go crazy with edits and flashes and, you know, lots of lots of uh, uh, images and stuff like that. So the guys that are doing the deep teaching uh, where they really get into things, I've seen guys that have stuff here and here and then over here. And it's like that takes a lot of work and I'm just not willing to put the time into it. I mean, maybe if I was making $10,000 for every video I uploaded, it would be worth the time. And I might, if I were making that kind of money, and some guys are, um, I might do that. Uh, well, I don't know about 10000 per video, but I knew, do know people that make, I know personally people that make five figures a month on YouTube. It's crazy. So uh, I will not name names. Um, let's see. And, and Michael, you like the banner. Yeah. And I, this this thing I'm not happy with. But me looking at this, I feel like I, I, and one of the things I really try to do is I really try to imagine myself in your position. Uh, that's really one of the things I do. I feel like if you're going to do a live stream, you got to keep it moving, at least with the interaction and with the talking and things like that. There are a lot of people that that uh, have too many brain farts to be doing live stream. So um, let's see. Uh, yeah. So seven dislikes yesterday. Oh, yesterday? Really? Seven dislikes? Holy cow. What the heck? Anyway. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll start the cage method. Oh, D DK. Okay. Not interested in learning songs now. I want to learn solid foundation. That's totally fine too. Um, and one of the things that I would always do when I was learning a song, DK, so you can still, like, if you want to learn a song and then analyze the song, like, okay, what, what notes are in this chord? L then you're learning your fretboard, the names of the notes. Then you're you're doing both. I mean, I'm I'm big about maximizing opportunities. I'm, what am I saying all the time? You learn one chord, you're learning twelve, right? I love stuff that can be applied. Oh, does that count? Does that count as a okay? Everybody, take a sip. Cheers. And I think I may be taking my friend Jim uh, in and out. Where I have to be on the other side of his door, but I, he doesn't, I don't think he has the coronavirus. So fortunately, his brother-in-law died of it in New York a couple of weeks ago. I, David, you know who I'm talking about. Um, Mark Bloom, the actor. That's my friend's brother-in-law. Really sad. He, um, and so, uh, and that's kind of why I've been trying to, I encourage you guys, you know, 
when you say goodbye to someone, just, you know, I mean, if, if you do say, I love you, just make sure that's the last thing that they hear you say, because man, people that get this and then they end up in a hospital, if you end up in a hospital, um, uh, oh, DK, you're young, you're a baby. Uh, if you end up in a hospital, oftentimes you can't talk. If you're intubated, um, you can't talk, you can't text. You're, you're going to, I mean, I think sometimes I don't, I, I just heard about this. Someone else was intubated and they had to put them in a coma. Cause I think when they put the tube down, it's hard. So they have to actually induce a coma. I don't know if that's true for everybody, but I heard about it. And I'm like, so at that point, you know, I think they said something like 80 to 90% of the people that are intubated die. So at that point, your, your, your goodbyes, there are no more goodbyes. So that's why I'm trying to make sure that every time I talk to somebody that is a dear friend or family member, I make sure they hear, I love you. And they know. So when I, if I'm gone, then they will know that. Uh, oh, did I hear write a story? Okay. So Diane is here. <laughs> Diane's here. When she gave me like big, big eyes. Okay. I see that now. Okay. Randy, yeah, you're, I'm, I'm 50, I'll be 59 this year. So we're right in the same camp. Um, uh, it's hard to start, you know, uh, it's hard to start older. Definitely. I know that anything is hard, harder. The older you get, the harder it is. It's like lear learning languages. Like a little kid can freaking learn 10 languages before they're 15. I mean, my my 15 year old students, when I had them, they would just they were sponges. I would give them a lesson and they would have it down the next week and they're like, give me more. And I'm like, OK, I give them twice as much and they would have it down the next week. Uh, but then anybody that was in the 40s or 50s, it was always like, yeah, I got to work on this some more. OK, well, let's do it together. It's and the, other, the main reason and the whole point of my seven tips for older beginners was that you have a life. You got responsibilities. You got a mortgage. You got kids in college or whatever. You've got a job. You've got you know, you've got your wife. You got responsibilities, volunteer things that you're doing. So you really want to maximize your time playing. Whereas when I was 15, I played five, eight hours a day, literally eight hours a day from the age of 15 to 35. Uh, and it, that was uh, practice. Uh, now I play eight hours a day because I'm getting paid to or I'm writing. So I, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very blessed life. Um, okay, so I do have a story. Um, I can tell you a story. Pretty crazy. So, sip, sip, sip. Okay, got the sips. Um, all right. Look, everybody's kind of telling their age here. Oh, yeah. I started when I was nine, Ab. AK, I started when I was nine. Uh, six acoustic guitars. Wow, nice. Bob Schumann, my sister is a nurse in Salon. Oh, well, God bless her. Um, Deej, you're only 17. Well, God bless you for sticking around. <laughs> I hope you're getting something from this. Uh, Keep at it, man. It. Uh, oh, you you just started going back to playing guitar, Dennis. Okay. Keith, what ha wait, what, what happened, to Keith? I miss Keith. Oh, we lost. A, yeah. Oh, you lost a Fenlimer yesterday. Yeah. It's. I mean, the numbers are still way below expectations. Doesn't change the pain. Doesn't change anything. But the truth is, in the big picture, it, the numbers are pretty down, and they're flattening. The, and really down in New York, I feel like. So the, I noticed that the the uh, hospital admissions are way down. So that's a good thing. Um, okay, so story time. Let me tell the story. And um, so just to preface this, probably one of the best music schools in the country is USC, U University of Southern California. Uh, the Thornton School of Music is very well respected. And a lot of really good composers studied there. Um, the Spielberg... Uh, school is there for film so that you got, I mean, Spielberg went there for film and they did the Spielberg school. And so there's lots of great filmmakers there. And so it, it, it tends to breed a lot of great um, uh, film composers as well, because they're all kind of cooped up in the same school. Um, and I, you know, like, you know, I went to Butler for a year, but I quit because I was uh, working so much. I couldn't keep my grades up and I'm not the best student. Um, I'm, I've never been a good student. I can learn anything, but I have to do it by myself. I have to figure it out. I have to take things apart, and put them back together again. And, and I, I do that with music and I do that with everything I've learned pretty much. Um, and so, you know, so I'm not at all cut out for academia. I just don't fit in. I feel like a fish out of water whenever I've been ever been on a college campus. Uh, but and I've taught, you know, I've done clinics and stuff like that. So Anyway, I, uh, when we lived in Pasadena, we lived in near Old Town, there was a school around the corner, literally around the corner, uh, a block away from our apartment that had an auditorium. And they started doing these uh, 
somebody sponsored these uh, Friday night or Monday night. I can't remember what night of the week it was, but guitar concerts. And there were some pretty darn good shows that came in there and they wouldn't even be full. It'd be like half the auditorium would be half full and you have like three different guitarists get up and perform sometimes with a band, sometimes by themselves. I'm like, I forget who put this thing together, but I would, I made a habit. Maybe it was once a month. It makes more sense. And so every, every time they would have one, I would walk around the corner and go to this thing. I don't even remember if it cost. I, I think it was free. So I go there and there, the, one of the performers is, um, is a guy named uh, Richard Smith, who's was, uh, may still be the head of the studio guitar program at USC. Um, and like I said, some of my favorite guitar players and from it, favorite composers went to USC. Um, and it's very expensive. Um, and so I, I wasn't, you know, it was never a consideration for me. I could, I, I wanted to go to Berkeley when I was in high school, but I was afraid to move away from home. I was a kind of a mama's boy. So I wanted, and I, and I knew I wanted to move to LA. So I was like, well, if I move to Boston, I might not ever get to LA. So I think I'll just stay in Indianapolis and save money. So that was kind of my tax. So, okay. That's the history. So I go to this one guitar night and the guitar player that's the head of the, the studio jazz program, kind of studio um, uh, backslash guitar. So they, he was teaching jazz guitar and, or he's head of the jazz guitar program and the studio guitar program, which was talking more about session, being a session musician. Um, like you can teach that. I mean, it's a very difficult thing to teach because you never know what you're going to need. I, my days are, every day is different. So musical didn't pre pre prepare me at all for any of this stuff. So, um, hey, Bebe. Um, so, uh, and Bob, I'm going to try to get, I'm going to try to do an interview with a rheumatologist for, about the arthritis thing. Um, meanwhile, I'll, while I'm talking, I'll do some of my finger exercises. If you want to join me, you can do, I, and if it hurts, don't do it. But I, these are ones that I, I do every day, usually walking to get Starbucks. You can just kind of follow along. Um, but anyway, so I go to this thing and, uh, my friend, uh, Jonathan is there and Jonathan's a really good guitar player, young kid. He went to USC through the studio program, almost got to the end. And then like he had one semester to go and his band got a record deal. Right. And so we're, we're talking before the whole thing. And he's kind of lamenting the fact that the, the band, his band got dropped. The deal fell through. Um, so, you know, and I was just, Oh man, I'm so sorry. And here, okay. That's another thing, but I, I, you know, he's a younger kid. He gets a record deal. He's a guitar player. You know, like I said, guitar players tend to be very insecure, jealous and all that. So I was tempted to be jealous for him. Um, but I would, uh, I would pray for him and, and pray that, that he would be blessed and that he would be very successful. And then right away, the jealousy went away. That's a great trick. If you want to get rid of jealousy, just whoever you're jealous of, pray that God gives them more. Sorry to talk about religion. I know some of you are like, don't talk about religion. It doesn't matter. You can just, you don't need to be religious. You can just say, I'm going to give that person good thoughts and you will stop being jealous for him. And then when good things happen to him, you can go, hey, I had a hand in that. He owes me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but anyway, so I, Jonathan was one of those people that, I, you know, I found myself having to pray for because I was tempted to be jealous. Uh, but anyway, we were having a great conversation and I, and I was le legitimately bummed that his band got dropped. You know, I really wanted him to be successful at that point. I had, an, a, you know, I was invested in his success. Um, and so uh, I um, we go we 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 have that talk and then we see this, this uh, Richard play. And Richard's amazing and he does jazz stuff and he you know, can do Pat Metheny stuff and he can do West Montgomery stuff. I mean, it's just really, and he's got his own voice too, which is cool. Really, really good. But, but it was mostly smooth jazz, which I'm not a huge fan of. But anyway, Richard come, sees Jonathan, who he knows because Jonathan went almost all the way through the program. And Jonathan and I are talking and Richard comes up to us and we have a three-way conversation. And, and Richard, Richard says, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, Jonathan, man, I brag about you all the time in front of the students, you know, like you're one of the successful ones. And Jonathan and I are kind of looking at each other like, yeah, bummer, you know, and then, and then, uh, so Richard turns to me, so who are you? And Jonathan, God bless him, he introduced me, he says, this is Tom, he's a great guitar player. He also is a really good worship leader. He leads worship at this big church, blah, blah, blah. And, and Richard says to me, so you, you lead worship at a church, huh? And I said, yeah, he goes, you know, a lot of my students, they pay for a lot of their school bills by playing for churches on the weekend. Um, he said, I'm an atheist, but would you be interested in maybe coming and teaching a, a, a class on that? 
And I'm like, at USC, <laughs> really? I'm thinking, uh, I'm eminently unqualified. I said, well, sure. He goes, he gave me his card. He goes, email me your information. I want to, I want to talk more. I want to meet with you about this. I'm like, okay. So, I mean, there's so many lessons in here. So the first lesson is I got home that night. And usually when someone would give me their card, I've got cards here from the NAM show of people I'm supposed to touch base with. And I met them in January and I still haven't emailed them. But because this was USC and it sounded interesting, I thought, you know what? I'm going to email. Him. So I emailed him literally that night and said, I would love to get together. Let me know what, if you want to do anything or whatever, you know, any, you know, whatever you want me to come down to school or whatever. So uh, he emailed me back that the next morning and said, um, I would love for you to meet the dean of the school of music. He said, would you come and have a meeting? I'll set up a meeting with the three of us and we can meet. And I went, you know, I'm like, yeah, sure. He goes, I would love for you to talk about what you might teach if you taught a class. And I went, okay. Um, and so I got busy. Um, I And lesson two is show up for a meeting way over prepared, especially if it's a meeting you want to, uh, um, that you want to lead to something to further your career. Um, and so this was before Google. I was on, you remember Yahoo communities and Yahoo, remember you would go to Yahoo and you would, Instead of being able to do a search, you had to click on something and then that would open a whole new window. And then you click on that and it would like sub subsection. See ya, AJ. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, so 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 I, I, you know, I had to go through. And so what I I did was I went to I found some churches like through the through Yahoo that were hiring and I printed up job descriptions. Um, and and salaries, because I knew that everyone graduating from USC, when you graduate with a music degree, there's you have no guarantee of any career, any job, nothing. And that I, I've known a lot of people that went to music school and they that was their common thing. It's like, well, I don't know what to do. Whereas my son who went to engineering school, in fact, he's going to USC getting his master's. Um, he's already got a job offer and salary up to here, full benefits and everything like that. He's 25 years, 26 years old. It's crazy, you know, but certain professions, you get a degree, you're going to get a job, but in music, art, the arts in general, you're not. So I'd heard a lot of that. So I wanted to show up to this meeting, showing them that, look, there's a lot of jobs out there that pay 30, 40, 50, 60,000 a year if you're a really good worship leader. And um, so, and then I went to a bunch of Christian colleges and, and, and that had worship degrees. And this was, again, this is, we're talking the nineties here, or no, no, early 2000s. Uh, early 2000s, and um, uh, I went and, and printed up their curriculum and their degree requirements. And I kind of looked at them and I went, yeah, this is great, but most like 80% of the classes were theology-based. And I'm kind of like, when I'm up there leading worship, playing guitar and singing and leading a band and leading a congregation, and teaching a choir and you know rearranging songs and everything like that, nobody's going to know my theology for the most part. They're going to know if I have music skills or not. So I thought, well, you know what that should be is should be more like most of the, the worship programs that I saw was like 80 percent classes on theology and Bible stuff and like 20 percent music classes. And I'm like, no, it should be about 50 50. I still think you should have good, you know, good grasp of theology and the Bible and things like that. Um, if you're going to be a worship leader and be working at a church, it makes sense. Uh, you know, when in Rome. So I, I printed a bunch of those up and had those right. And then I created a. Uh, a plan for like a, I think it was 13 week course or something like that. I forget how long the semester was, but I think it was 13 weeks. Um, and I did like 13 lesson plans. I mean, I did all of this work in a couple, less than a couple weeks. And I show up at this meeting and I park, I, I, it's funny cause I was just there recently. I went to a USC game and I parked like almost in the same exact parking space. It made such a huge impact on my brain going there because it was such a major, I was so nervous and I'm like sweating bullets. I show up, I park the car, I'm walking across campus. I'm looking around. I just totally felt way out of, I felt like Joseph in Pharaoh's court. I just didn't feel like I belonged at all. And never, never in college did I ever feel like I belong. So, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm missing stuff here. 
Yes. Yeah. Or I'm. Or that's another thing. I was. I was early to this meeting. So of course, I'm, then I had to sit in the lobby of, or the the uh, you know the reception area of the dean of the school of music, and I get there, and then um, I'm waiting to go to this meeting, and then Richard shows up, and like, oh hey, so glad you could do this and everything, and um, uh, so uh, I I um. Uh, sorry, I got a text from my daughter. I'm, I'll deal with it later. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Um, and so the dean opens a door and he's not much older than I am. Like he's a relatively new dean. I think he'd been there about a year. I think he's still the dean. Um, it's been a while. And um, I, he, oh, he, God bless him. I mean, he, he says, Tom, it's great to meet you. I just wanted to let you know that in the 70s, I was a rock guitar player, and I've been a choir director at churches for the last 30 years. And so totally put me at ease. He's like, he's saying, I can totally relate to where you're coming from. You know, I'm a musician, and I'm also a church musician. Um, and so we sit down, and he goes, so tell me about what, you know, and, and of course, Richard introduces me, and then I start describing um, what my what my class would look like. And again, I don't think this is really going to happen. Um, and uh, I, I tell him, you know, this is what I, and I said, here's, here's a list of jobs that would be, you know, that you could get right out of college. And he's, this is blowing him away because again, like I said, you know, people graduate from music school, really, they don't have any way of finding work. It's really, really difficult. And so he's like, that's cool. And then I showed him like, here's what the program is. I think what if you were going to do some kind of thing. And so he stops me after I show him the thing. And he goes, yeah, I don't want you to teach a class here. And, and I, I said, oh, okay, I totally understand. He goes, no, no, I want you to create a master's degree program here at USC in worship leading. And I said, what? And I said, I'm sorry, Dean, but I could give you a, I could give you 10 a list of 10 people that are far more qualified than I am to do this. And he goes, I'm not interested in them. I want you to do this. And I said, what? He goes, well, let's start with you doing a clinic. I want you to do a clinic here. Can you do one? Uh, I want to have one uh, later this semester. Can you set that up, Richard? And so Richard said, oh, heck yeah, let's do a clinic. And Richard says, Richard, I just want to let you know, you know, he reiterates, he goes, I'm, I'm an atheist, but I think I want all of my students to take, if Tom teaches a class, I want all of my students to take his class they have to take this 13th century conducting course. My guitar players have to take this like 17th century conducting course. I, I a class. I don't want them to take that. That's completely useless. They should take Tom's class. And I'm like, okay. So we set it up. I did a clinic. I set it up and I did a like a three hour clinic on worship leading or playing. Yeah, I think that's what it was about. And um, they promoted it on the campus. It was interesting. And I had 12 people show up at this clinic. And you go, well, that's not very many. And, and for me, I was like, yeah, I was used to having, when I taught clinics from Renata, I was used to having 200 guitar players in a giant room. And I was teaching 200 players at the same time, which was no small task. And um, so I um, uh, taught, but, but, but they were saying, no, actually, this is the second, this is the end, of, this is the spring semester. And they said, this is the second highest attended clinic at USC this year. I said, really? And the other thing is there were six guys and six girls. So people kept walking by this guitar room, which is a big room for all the guitar cl clinics and stuff. And it was, <clears throat> they kept seeing girls and they're like, what, what are girls doing it by? Okay, Josh has got a question. Um... Oh, any suggestions on learning to transition faster, like, or like everything else, just practice. Oh, uh, Josh, I, you know, I want to do a video on open chords uh, for beginners and how to tr change chords faster, if that's what you're talking about, beginner stuff. I may do a video on that soon. I need to come up with like maybe five tips for that, five things to think about. But uh, yeah, I've got some ideas on that. Um, but yeah, you definitely just practice this game. You're going to be key for anything. So I teach this clinic and people keep poking their head in the room like, what's going on here? Why are there women in the guitar department? And uh, so I taught the clinic and it went really well. And the other clinic that was more attended than mine was Pat Metheny's. That was the only clinic that year that had more people. And it had like 60 people. And I'm like, well, why didn't you tell me Pat Metheny was there? I would have gone to that. And um, and when I told him that, you know, 
when I was in that meeting, I said, look, I don't even have a degree. And he goes, well, I'll tell you what, while you're creating this program, you can go to school here and get your degree here. And I'm like, well, that sounds like a lot of work. And so ultimately what happened was, um, so Richard um, basically try kind of was, it had to go under someone's wings and Richard uh, took it on a little bit. And I think he had a meeting. He didn't bring me to the meeting. He probably should have brought me into the meeting or maybe it was just emails to the sacred music department and the, and the choral music department, I think. And those are the two departments that would deal with uh, kind of would be church related. And um, uh, they weren't, neither of those departments were interested at all in having contemporary, you know, worship be part of their thing. And if I had had that meeting, if I'd gone and met with the head of the sacred music department, I would have told him probably something to the effect that, look, a new church is being finished every day and none of them have organs or choir lofts. Um, so the new reality for all the churches being built today is that they're basically preparing to just have rock bands in there. Um, and so that's kind of, that would have been my opening. And, 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 and if they had issues with contemporary worship, I would have agreed with every issue they had. Cause of course I love traditional hymns and I love Bach and all that stuff in classical music, but so it's not, it's not a perfect, uh, contemporary worship is not perfect, but, and there's definitely flaws with it. And I wouldn't have disagreed with it. So I think I would have had a good rapport with them and they might've then allowed it to happen. The other thing that happens is that I think Richard went on sabbatical or something. So then he, um, there was a year where he wasn't overseeing it and, you know, it just kind of died a slow death. And I could only do so much on my end. I made a couple emails and tried to kind of push it along, but it really wasn't ever meant to be. I don't think they have that program at all. No one did it. it you know, I didn't make it happen. So it didn't get, ha it didn't happen. Uh, but it was and it was amazing meeting. I was very overprepared, and it it led to some pretty preposterous opportunities that, again, I didn't really take full advantage of. Mainly because actually, it's interesting because James Smith, who was the head of the guitar department, the classical guitar department, he became a friend, and he um, he would invite me out to do uh, when they had recitals and stuff, and I would come out and sit through the long, really long recitals. Um, and he would introduce me and he would just brag about me like this, you know, because I wrote classical pieces and he just thought I was this composer and it blew me away. But I ran into him one time at a park and he's like 60 years old and he had a baby with him. I said, is this your grandchild? And like the kid was like two years old. He goes, this is my son. And I went, really? He goes, yeah. <laughs> and apparently he married one of his students. He started dating one of his students while he was still married or something. And it turned into this big scandal and he ended up marrying her and having a kid. And, and he said, yeah, he said, getting tenured cost me my first marriage. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not interested in spending all my time at USC and getting tenured and creating, but if I created a degree degree program, I would have automatically been tenured and my kids could have gone to USC for free, which would have been nice. Uh, so those were pluses, but that's my USC story. I hope that's not too boring of a story for you, Diane. Uh, but that's it. Now, let's see if I got any questions. Uh, uh, Kathy, okay, the Josh question. Yeah, that's a huge question. So, yes, ultimately, uh, Josh, one of the secrets that I, I – okay, I'll give you a trick that, that I would recommend. Um, uh, let me go with a classical guitar. So now you can take a sip because I'm changing guitars. Let's say you're, you're having trouble going from C to D. Um, and the reason you're having trouble, you're having trouble going from C to D when you're playing a song is like G. Okay, say so that's you. All right, well, the, part of the problem here is you're wasting a lot of time playing a song that where you have a change you don't need to work on. Um, so... Um, so what you want to do instead of strumming two bars of C and two to go to two bars of D, just play C once and then go to D once and then back and forth. Just keep going back and forth. Work on that. Get that. Uh, uh, who was it? DK, you were talking about um, DK, you were talking about wanting to uh, get the basics, get a foundation before you start learning songs. Like I said, you can create your own foundation from songs. So that song that I was playing, just G, E minor, C, D, it's basically one, six, four, five in the key of D, G. Very, very common to a million songs. Well, if you're having trouble playing it, 
that means you're having trouble playing a song, uh, this whatever song this might be. So what you can do then now, you can take a, a piece of that song and turn it into an exercise. Like, like when I was trying to learn the Via Lobos, um, I think it's prelude number one, I was having a hard time with the right hand, let alone trying to play the left hand. So um, what I did was I, you could literally practice the right hand without anything on the left. You can just do all open strings and get that pattern down that you're trying to get. And so that's, you can, you can take songs that you're learning and create exercise and foundation building tools with parts of the songs. I've done that my entire life on the guitar. And, and oftentimes that's what, because you don't want to come to a spot in a song where you have to pause or think or make a mistake or whatever. You're going to make a mistake every single time. In fact, that song had a passage in it because it's so redundant right hand wise. But then there was a passage that was different than the rest of the piece. And I had to play that passage a thousand times before I could do it without freaking out when I got to it. Because psychologically, when you were doing classical stuff, especially when you, you got a passage that you, you know you're going to blow, <laughs> you're going to blow it. You just know it and you blow it. And it's psychological. You have it down. You got all the tools to play it, but you just you screw it up every time because you you've messed it up every time. So hopefully, I didn't just get a uh, a bad word in there. <laughs> so um, yeah, DK, awesome. I'm so glad. And I, I I do want to do a video for very very beginners to help them do. And that was one of the tips. Is just look, don't play the whole song. Just find the two chords you're struggling with and go back and forth between those two. And then. The other thing I always say is just look at the path of the fingers and move them all at the same time. Don't move one finger at a time. Try to get to the point where you're moving them all and then use a metronome to force you to go faster. Um, and then then that will help because you, you can go one, two, and then you, you're going to need somebody to push you to go one, two, one, two, like that. Ciao, Bebe. Sorry, oh, you were late, I think, but... Um, Oh, she needs, <laughs> she needs the computer to study. Yeah, sure she does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, she's all bored with TikTok now. She's been on TikTok all day on her phone. Uh, okay, let's see. Is there any technique called pivoting? Use the finger to pivot. Some chords, yeah, like like a lot of times, like when we were talking about the um, the G to the, to the C2, a lot of times if you're doing that and you go to D, you can just use what you can have this finger. This never leaves. I call that kind of pivoting where... Um, like in basketball, it's kind of a basketball reference, right? Where you keep the pivot foot down and you move the other foot. That's kind of what's happening here. And that does, when you have a, a pivot finger, I guess you could call it, um, that does give you a little bit more confidence when it comes to changing chords. Uh, but ultimately when you're playing, you can't always have that. Although, because remember when I did that, uh, so what was it? Every... That, that G was on top of every one of those. I mean, you could call that a pivot note, but this is not easy. <laughs> and that's an exercise right there. We talked about this the other day. What, what was the chord we did the, um, what C, what was it, a C? What was it? A, oh, oh, we did, uh, was it G? No, we did that sharp five, flat five thing that we turned it into an exercise. Those are great exercises. We're going to get into drop two chords real soon. So we'll have a lot of those that I'll be mentioning all the time. Okay, turn this into an exercise. Turn this into an exercise. We'll have a lot of those coming up. And those will be with jazz chords, but they won't be impossible to finger. We're going to learn where the fifth and where the ninth is so that we can alter the fifth and ninth and have sharp nine chords and five, five chords and all that stuff. So it sounds complex. In a harmonic sense, it's fairly complex, but you know, in an actual finger meets the road concept. It's not that bad. Okay. So I'm going to get ready to sign off tomorrow. We are going to do ninth chords. See a hook. Yep. Uh, yeah. So we're done. Um, let's see. I'm trying to finish <laughs> sooner than I did yesterday. Yesterday I went two hours and 33 minutes. Can you believe that? Uh, yeah, exactly. Start. Yeah. That's usually what, and you can just go through the open doors. Um, let's see. I have to leave you my, okay. Uh, I got that Bruce, uh, I, and I, I consider myself taught, but self uh, largely self-taught. Um, okay. All right. So let's, let's, I'll sign off and I'll end the stream, but you guys keep chatting. I'll say uh, goodbye. God bless you guys. And my hair is doing some crazy stuff right now. Okay. I'll see you. I'll see you tomorrow. Hopefully.